Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. And what a joy it is to live that way of life. Jesus Christ is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the Holy Bible, and thank God for it, is our only standard and authority for truth. And together God's people say with hearts of praise, joy, and hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, friends, today is February the 16th in the year of our Lord, 2018, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, I trust that you are feeling blessed in Jesus this morning, that you are thankful for the word of God. I mean, truly, deeply grateful that God has given us his holy word, that he has placed his spirit within us to guide us, to lead us, and to teach us all things holy, and that we have the riches and greatness of the hope that lies before us, eternal life with our Lord and King, Jesus Christ. And if you can answer yes to that, friends, then truly your heart is full of praise and joy this morning. Well, we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible, and today we find ourselves picking up in Exodus chapter 16. Now, before we begin, it's important for us to pause and realize the implications that lie within this story that apply to our personal journey. You see, there was one time where we too were in bondage and we had a taskmaster over us and we were his slaves. Just as the people of Israel were in bondage, they were under Pharaoh, he was their taskmaster and they suffered greatly under his rule. Well, just as God brought them out of Egypt, and delivered them from the bondage of the taskmaster they were under, so too when we were delivered, when we were set free, when we received our liberty, our salvation through what Jesus did for us, now that we have been delivered, we are to never return to those things of old. We are new creations in Christ Jesus and we no longer walk according to the rule of the old taskmaster, we now are slaves unto the Lord Jesus, and we live according to his rule and authority. Well, when we begin that journey with Christ, we start out as babes in Christ. We are creatures of flesh. Our minds have been programmed to think a certain way. Our feelings and emotions have ruled us for so long that it's sometimes hard to break those old habits. And so as we are being raised in the family of God, we must learn how to walk as a follower of Jesus, talk as a follower of Jesus, think as a follower of Jesus, act as a follower of Jesus. And just as a small baby, an infant learns these things as he progresses through the years of his life cycle, so too we learn these things spiritually as we progress in the years of our spiritual life cycle. And so it's important for us to understand the correlations between our specific journey with the Lord Jesus, our growth in the Christian life, and what we read of here in this story with the people being delivered from bondage, and now they are learning to walk and to trust in the God who desires to lead and guide them. And this doesn't come easy for them. When we were last together, we saw that the children of Israel were full of praise. They were singing great praises and songs of joy unto God. But the moment that they arrived in the wilderness and they realized that they no longer had the pleasures that Egypt offered them, they began to murmur against the Lord. They began to complain to Moses. And so often it is with us as well. When we enter into our Christian lives, we enter in with great joy and anticipation because we are looking forward to all the great things that God is going to do for us. But we don't realize at that point the misery, the pain, the suffering, the hardship, the dedication, the effort, the work, the discipline that the Christian life requires. And many times 
the fault lies at the one who leads us to the Lord Jesus because they don't share with us the full picture. And that's what Luke chapter 14 is all about. When Jesus says before we enter into the kingdom, we might want to sit down and consider the cost of all that is required. Because if we don't understand the cost, once we've entered into the journey and we realize the difficulties that lie ahead of us, it's easy for us to want to turn back. And that's why the children of Israel had to cross the Red Sea because once they got on the other side and God closed the sea up, there was no way back for them to return. And it's important for us to have a place in our spiritual life that represents the Red Sea. There is no returning. There is no going back. We are here. We've made the decision. We've signed the spiritual covenant between us and God. And now, no matter how hard times get, we simply are to press on, seeking to be as obedient to the things of the Lord as we possibly can. And so that's where we pick up today in our text, because we see as the people came into the wilderness, it says in verse 2, the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Now, even though they're murmuring against Moses because he is a physical representation of a leader unto them, actually they are murmuring against God who has led them into the wilderness. And God takes this very personal, and that's why we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, do not murmur, do not complain, do not even question the events in your life as to why God would bring them upon you. Because some of the people in Moses' time also murmured, and they were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, all these things happen to them for examples unto us, and they are written for our admonition or warning upon whom the ends of the world are to come. And so let us learn not to complain and murmur against the Lord, to question the Lord in times of suffering, but let us remember to give him thanks in all things at all times, even when things are falling apart around us. Well, back to our text in Exodus chapter 16, verse 4, the Lord said to Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people will go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them. Notice, I'm setting a law on how the people are to collect their daily portion, and I'm doing this to see whether they're going to obey me or not. Well, in verse 20, we see they did not obey the Lord. It says, notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses or unto the Lord, but some of them left of it until the morning, and it bred worms and stink, and Moses was wroth with them. Now what they were to do is they were to go out and they were to gather just enough to get them through the day. They were to do this six days of the week, and on the sixth day they were to gather a double portion, and that would hold them over on the Sabbath, because they were to do no work on the Sabbath. You must keep in mind here, the Ten Commandments have not yet been given. So where does honoring the Sabbath come from? It comes from the very creation itself. God rested on the seventh day, and from that moment, men have honored that day as unto a rest unto the Lord. That's why when the commandment is finally given to Moses, it says, remember the Sabbath. Well, you can only remember something that you've already known, you've already been told. Well, the Lord, seeing the disobedience of the people in verse 28, says to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my law? You see, the problem is, is that we as men always want to do what we want to do. And when we find ourselves obeying ourselves, that only leads us to stand in guilty before the Most High because our ways are in opposition of His ways. 
And so if we find ourselves doing what we want to do, most of the time we are in direct disobedience unto God and we are not following, we are breaking his commandments and his laws. And that's where the people find themselves. They're longing after the pleasures that they had in Egypt. If you'll remember, we talked about this a couple of videos back in Numbers chapter 11, verse 5, the children of Israel said, we remember the fish in Egypt. We remember the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, and the onions. We remember the garlic and all these other things that we feasted upon that brought great delight to our palates to our taste buds. And yet if we read further on in chapter 16 of Exodus, we see that the children of Israel did eat manna 40 years. They baked it, they boiled it, they fried it, but every day, three times a day, for 40 years, it was still the same thing, manna. I could not imagine eating the same thing every single day, three times a day for 40 years. Yet there's an important lesson to learn here, and it is the discipline on the simple things of God. You see, just as they physically partook of the manna every day for 40 years, and that seems a simple thing when you think about all that the world has to offer when it comes to different types of food and delicacies, but so too we in our journey with the Lord Jesus we are expected to feast upon the word of God every single day. And if you talk to some people, they would say, well, that would become so boring. That's so simple. Why would God want us to read the same thing every day? That would get old. And yet we must be very careful with an attitude like that because that's murmuring. That's complaining against the Lord. Our duty as his people is simply to obey what he has commanded us and that is to feast upon the milk of the word every single day of our lives. And it must become a discipline that is so grounded within us that we do it without even thinking about it. Could we be using that time spent reading God's words, feasting on the delicacies that this world has to offer us, all the pleasure, all the entertainment, all the little things that technology offers us today? Yes, surely we could, but we are to set those things aside and discipline ourselves to feast upon the word of God. And I trust that you're doing that, friend. Well, we're going to close there today. And if you haven't already, I encourage you to go back and start at Exodus chapter 1 and read to where we are today and look for the spiritual implications of how those stories that you're given in the early chapters of the book of Exodus, how each of those events apply to your Christian life. Because the parallels are more than coincidental. And as we read a few moments ago, they are there for our learning, that we would look to them as an example and we would be very careful, very careful, friends, not to fall into the same place of murmuring, complaining, acts of immaturity and childlikeness in our relationship with God, in our journey, but that we would learn to trust in the hand of God accept the simplest things in life and be content with what he has given us and determine in ourselves not to desire what the world, the old life has to offer us. And if you do that, you'll see a very clear line drawn in the sand where things are black and white. And you'll understand what Jesus said when he said, you cannot serve two masters. You must make a choice. He who is not 100% sold out for me is against me. You must be either hot on fire for Jesus or you must be either cold in absolute rebellion against Jesus. But you cannot be lukewarm. If you're lukewarm, I will spew you. In the Greek, that means I will vomit you out of my mouth. You make me sick, says the Lord. Friends, those are severe, stern words from our Lord. And so let us give serious attention to what we're reading in the book of Exodus as we read about the people of Israel 
and let us learn from them so that we can be more faithful, dedicated, committed followers of our Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God, the King of glory, and he who is to rule for all time and throughout eternity. Hallelujah. Well, I love you, friends. I'm so grateful again that you're with us. I pray that the word of God is stirring deeply within you and that you are truly seeing the changes and effects of its work in your life. And you are becoming the man and woman of God that he created you to be from the moment that you were conceived in your mother's womb. Now, as he wills and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I pray for each of you. Now, until next time, I'll see you on the next video.